Welcome to worship with us today at Grace Lutheran Church in Lowell. Now, the order of service that we're following, for those of you who are watching along, is in a data file that you can receive off of our webpage. The theme of our service today is the joy that Christians know by the grace of God. And that's because this Sunday is the fourth Sunday in the season of Lent. It's known by a traditional name, Lottere Sunday, which is Latin, and it comes from a part of our psalm reading for this morning, Psalm 122. I rejoiced with those who said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. And in the face of, of a variety of things that we are dealing with in life, the Christian always can find joy because we know that we have joy in the Lord because our God is gracious to us. Now, as we begin our worship this morning, we do so as we always do when we gather together. We begin in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please join me now as we confess our sins together before our Lord. Holy and merciful Father, I confess that I am by nature sinful and that I have disobeyed you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have done what is evil in your sight and have failed to do what is good. For this, I know that I deserve your punishment, both now and for eternity. But I am truly sorry for all my sins, and trusting in the perfect life and innocent death of my Savior, Jesus Christ, I plead, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Now, our gracious Lord and Master has shown us his mercy. He has given his one and only Son to save us from all our sins. And now, carrying out my office as a called servant of Christ and according to his command and authority, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. <clears throat> as we move forward in our service for today, We go to a scripture reading from John chapter 16, verses 17 through 33. Jesus spoke these words in the upper room to his disciples on Monday, Thursday evening. He had made it abundantly clear to them that he was going to be leaving them, and their hearts were distressed. He made it clear on more than one occasion that he would be turned over to the hands of, into the hands of his enemies, that he would suffer and die, and that on the third day he would rise, but, but all of that had gone over the heads of the disciples. And so he comforts them here, and he comforts us also in all of the challenges and the trials that we face in life, including the trial for us as Christians of not being able to gather together for worship on Sunday morning. We read, Therefore some of his disciples asked one another, What does he mean when he tells us, In a little while, you are not going to see me, and again, in a little while, you will see me, and because I am going to the Father. So they kept asking, what does he mean by a little while? We don't understand what he's saying. Jesus knew that they wanted to ask him about this, and so he said to them, are you trying to determine with one another what I meant by saying, in a little while, you are not going to see me, and again, in a little while, you will see me? Amen, amen, I tell you. You will weep and wail, but the world will rejoice. You will be sorrowful, but your sorrow will be turned to joy. A woman giving birth has pain because her time has come. But when she has delivered the child, she no longer remembers the anguish because of her joy that a person has been born into the world. So also you will have sorrow now. But I will see you again. Your heart will rejoice, and no one will take your joy away from you. In that day, you will not ask me anything. Amen, amen, I tell you. Whatever you ask the Father in my name, he will give you. Until now, you have not asked for anything in my name. Ask, and you will receive, so that your joy may be complete. I have told you these things using figurative language. A time is coming when I will no longer speak to you using figurative language, but I will tell you plainly about the Father. And that day you will ask in my name, and I am not telling you that I will make requests to the Father on your behalf, for the Father himself loves you 
because you have loved me and have believed that I came from God. I came from the Father and have come into the world. Now I am going to leave the world and go to the Father. Yes, the disciples said, now you are speaking plainly and not using figurative language. Now we know that you know everything and do not need to have anyone ask you anything. For this reason, we believe that you came from God. Jesus answered them, now do you believe? Listen, a time is coming. In fact, it is here when you will be scattered, everyone to his own home. You will leave me all alone. Yet I am not going to be alone because the Father is with me. I have told you these things so that you may have peace in me. In this world, you are going to have trouble. But be courageous. I have overcome the world. Now, there's one other portion of Scripture that I'd like to share with you before we get to our sermon this morning. It's our children's devotion for today from Luke chapter 15. It's verses 8 through 10. The parable of the lost coin. Or what woman has ten silver coins, if she loses one coin, would not light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it? And when she finds it, she calls together her friends and neighbors and says, Rejoice with me, because I have found the lost coin. In the same way, I tell you that there is joy in the presence of the angels of God, over one sinner who repents. I brought along a plate this morning from our family's dinner set. This plate is like a plate that my granddaughter Sadie was carrying a couple of nights ago. She had all of her food on it, and her sister Kyla grabbed her foot for a moment. And Sadie went tumbling, the plate went up in the air, and then it landed on the floor, and it shattered into pieces like this. Now, these are two of the bigger pieces that the plate ended up as. There was a very, very small piece that ended up in Sadie's finger because Sadie got down and scared because she'd broken the plate, was trying to pick everything up. That splinter moved far enough into her finger that it brought out some blood, and of course, it brought out some tears. First I, and then her grandmother, the nurse, tried to use a needle to pick out that splinter, and she kept saying it was still there and it still hurt. We couldn't even see it. But the tears and the blood told us everything that we needed to know. Finally, that splinter came out, and the tears stopped. There was a smile on her face, and it was as though she hadn't been hurt at all. She, she went on her way. I want to talk to you about that splinter in Sadie's finger this morning, because the pain that she had in a lot of ways is like the pain that we have just living every day as sinners in a sinful world. We get sick, our, our feelings get hurt, bad things, at least we call them bad things, happen to us. But God, in his love for us, takes care of us the same way Grandma helped get that splinter out of Sadie's finger. And the moment that that splinter was gone, Sadie's tears stopped, and she was happy again, and she was on her way. In a sinful world, what God in his love has done for us is send his son to be our savior. Jesus not only did everything that we can't do, he did everything right, we do everything wrong, and that's what God calls sin. He did everything right and gives us the credit for it. And then for all of the wrong things that we did, Jesus was punished in our place. God put him to death on a cross, made him suffer what hell is, so that you and I will never die in hell. But instead, because we are forgiven of those sins, through faith in Jesus, we'll live forever in heaven. Now, that means whatever happens to us in life, from the splinters in our finger to the friends that turn against us, to missing school right now, and I know a lot of you children miss school. You wish you could be back with your friends and, and be out playing. 
It's possible that mom or dad or grandma or grandpa could get sick. And, and some people we know might even die because of this illness that right now is closing stores and restaurants and shutting life down for us. But because we have faith in Jesus, no matter how painful this all might be right now, the pain someday will be gone when God and his love takes us to heaven and the angels in heaven celebrate not only every time someone believes, they celebrate when you believe, but the angels also celebrate when we get to be home with God in heaven. So don't worry about what's happening right now, and, and don't get upset about what might happen to you in life that won't necessarily be good, because God's got a plan for you. And that plan is to give you eternal life in heaven through faith in Jesus. And just as the angels rejoice, when people like you believe, one day you're going to rejoice too, and so will I, when we get to be with God forever in heaven. That's our children's lesson for today. Let's continue now <clears throat> with our sermon for today. Our sermon is based on the words that God gave the Apostle Paul in Philippians chapter 4. What I'd like to do is read to you verse 4. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again. Rejoice. A man stopped at a Lutheran church one day. The pastor was in his office, and he went inside asking the secretary if he could speak to the reverend, and, well, she brought him to the pastor's office, and he made this request. He said, sir, my beloved dog just passed away, and I would really appreciate it if you could give my dog a funeral. Well, the pastor looked at him, never having given a funeral for a dog before, and he said, I'm sorry, sir, but in the Lutheran church, we, we don't perform burials for dogs. Well, the man looked at him and said, I understand. And then the pastor said, you know, if you go down the road to the next church, they'll probably serve you and bury your dog because they'll do just about anything for anybody. Well, the man started to walk out the door saying, thank you, Reverend. And then he turned around and he said, Reverend, you wouldn't mind if I ask you one question. And the pastor said, sure, what else can I do for you? He said, well, I'd like to give a gift to the church that buries my dog. And I don't really know what an appropriate amount is. I was thinking about maybe $10,000, but that might be too small. What do you think? And the minister said, wait, wait, you didn't tell me that your dog was a Lutheran. Now we can smile a little bit at the story, and given what's all going on right now around us, smiling isn't a bad thing. I've seen a lot of sad faces lately, and I've listened to conversations, and I've had them with people where it's very obvious that we're worried, we're concerned, we're distressed, even though God says don't worry about anything, about your life, what you will wear, uh, about what you'll eat or drink, because your Heavenly Father knows what you need, and He promises to provide not only everything material, but most importantly, He promises to provide everything spiritual through His Word and Sacrament. He's given you the gift of everlasting life through faith in Christ. And he'll take care of everything else that you need as well. The problem is, like that dog, we're going to die someday. Every one of us is born mortal. And while it's possible that Jesus could come back in my lifetime and yours, it's likely that we will pass away before that happens. Others will make funeral arrangements for us, just like we have made funeral arrangements for people that we know and love. And whenever we're dealing with that, it always hurts a lot. And it hurts for a long time. In times like this, a lot of people are worried about dying. Thousands around the world have already died of the coronavirus, and it has arrived in the United States. People are dying today. A lot of people are ill in our communities. Life has changed as we know it, whether temporarily or, or more permanently. And all of us are threatened to one extent or another, no matter how young or how old you are. 
But of course, they're telling us over and over again that those with underlying health conditions are the most vulnerable. And if you've got those underlying health conditions, you might be staying at home right now, avoiding everyone practicing social distancing, whether the government encourages you to or not, because you're afraid that you could catch this virus and possibly pass away. For others, they've lost their jobs already. This week, we've had seven individuals in our church family who have been told by their employers that they're not going to have a job in the future. For those of you who have investments and have been counting on them to fund your life, well, if they've been in the stock market, the stock market has been tumbling. It's lost over 30% of its value, and I'm sure that your portfolio has taken a punch. We've got family distress going on in a lot of homes because people have cabin fever, because they're being around each other by the government's appeal a lot more than they've been before, and words are being said that aren't kind, and people need to hide sometimes from family, but in a house, sometimes there's nowhere to hide. We're struggling, a lot of us, with discouragement, depression, and some of us are looking at the prospect that we might just die from this. That's why it's amazing when the Apostle Paul says, Rejoice in the Lord always, I will say it again, rejoice. Because when we hear those words from Paul, we're a little flummoxed. And what we really want to say is, Paul, do you understand what's going on? Do you know what my life is like? Maybe, Paul, you need to be here in 21st century America and, and sit in our shoes for a while and see what life for us is like. Now, the Apostle Paul, if he were speaking to us, would say, bring it on. Go ahead, let, let's swap sandals. Because when I wrote these words to you, I was writing them from a Roman prison cell. I was chained up. But I was encouraging Christians even in the face of my problems and in my peril, with the promise of God's love, that God will give us the strength to get through anything, from, from persecution to a virus to whatever else in life comes. I kept my attitude over the years by God's grace because he brought me to faith and kept me in the faith. And God's done the same for every one of you. You know what my life was like before I was sitting in this prison? Five times the Jews whipped me, 40 lashes minus one, and 40 lashes was usually the amount that they, that they whipped a person and put him to death. So I was whipped to the brink of death. I was stoned. Three times I was beaten with steel rods and my bones broke. Three times I, I was shipwrecked. I spent a day and a night in the ocean not knowing whether or not I would drown in an all because I was serving Jesus Christ. And yet even then, in the midst of all of my sufferings and hardship, I kept my joy in Jesus because God had claimed me for eternal life in heaven. And whatever I was dealing with in this life, it was but a momentary speck in the broad timeline of eternity. The same joy I had in Jesus, you have too, because the same Spirit that gave me faith has given you faith. And that faith in Jesus allows us to find an inner joy in the midst of our tears and pain. And it's what makes sorrow bearable for the Christian. Now, when Paul said, Rejoice in the Lord always. Paul didn't say that everything you experience in life should make you happy when your neighbor's house burns down or when the coronavirus hits or when you get caught in the middle of a sin. That's not a time to walk around with a smile on your face. That would be unbiblical and in many ways reprehensible. We don't find joy in everything that happens. But remember these three little words, rejoice in the Lord. What that means 
is that we can find joy through our faith relationship with Jesus and because of what Jesus has done for us, no matter what happens, even if your husband or your wife or your mother or father or son or daughter or grandma or grandpa should pass away, even if there are tears streaming down your face, there's still an inner joy that we have as Christians, first of all, because we know that those who die in the Lord don't die. Their souls continue to live, and they're in heaven with Jesus right now. They've received the goal of their faith. And second, for those who pass away in Christ, because we also are in Christ, we know that we will see them again when God calls us from this life to be with him and with them in heaven. Never forget that earth has no sorrow. God's grace and everlasting life in heaven can't heal. Now, let's look at all of this from a decidedly gospel perspective. Let's start by reminding ourselves what God in Christ has done for us, because that's why we rejoice in the Lord always. God sent his one and only son to be our savior from sin. Jesus did what for us is unfathomable. He kept each and every commandment of God every day of his life. He never fell into sin even once, and he gives you and me the credit for his flawlessness. So God looks at every one of us for the sake of Jesus and sees not sinful people, but perfect saints. More than that, that Savior swapped places with us. We deserved eternal death in hell for all of the things that you and I have said and thought and done that are wrong in the sight of God. But Jesus suffered all of that on the cross, not just for me and for you, but for everyone who's ever lived or who ever will live. God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. He died for every one of us in the world. And more than that, he freed us from hell's curse. He forgave all of our sins, and he has reconciled us to God so that instead of being God's enemies and being afraid of God, we love God, and we have absolutely nothing to fear. And we look forward to the day when we will be with God in heaven. Now, for us, if Jesus doesn't come back first, that means we're going to have to pass away or die. But for the believer in Christ, death isn't something that we're afraid of. Our bodies might stop working, but our souls continue to live on. And one day, our bodies will be brought out of the grave, perfected just as Jesus was. That's what Jesus' resurrection proves to us. That not only are we forgiven, not only is he God, but as he conquered death, death holds no power over us either. There are some other assurances that God has given you and me. Those assurances are first that we are God's children. We have a real identity. Second, we have absolute security in the promises of God. And third, while we're living here in this world, we have a purpose for living. Let's talk about our identity for a moment. You know, a lot of people have their, their identities wrapped up in the things of this world and in what they possess and who they're around and in what they do. For example, Right now in the news, professional football is, is the one sport to which people can still pay attention because free agents are moving back and forth. Now, these are gifted athletes. There's, there's no doubt about that. And they are handsomely paid for what they do. You ask a professional football player, who are you? And he's going to tell you what team he plays for, what position he plays, maybe how long he's been playing, and he's certainly going to tell you how much he loves the game. But what happens to those football players who retire or who are injured and can't play the game anymore? Some of them move on seamlessly into ordinary life. But for others, there's a tremendous loss of identity because football was their life, and they don't know what to do anymore. And the same is true for you and me. When we wrap our, our lives around our money, around our jobs, around our children or our parents or, or our spouse, then when God changes the equation for us, sometimes we don't know what to do and we can't function. When our world crumbles, what then? Well, what then 
is that we need to keep our focus on Jesus or refocus on Christ if our faith has been faltering a little bit. You and I should never forget who we are, Christians, and whose we are, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And when we remember that, then we can find that that joy again in our hearts. There's a story about a, a young man who was an African prince. He was captured by slave traders many years ago, carried across the Atlantic Ocean, and put on an auction block at a a slave trading site in America. Uh, Most of the slaves that, that were being sold that day had their heads down like this. They were beaten, battered, and humiliated emotionally, and they knew what lay ahead for them. But not this young man. He stuck out his chest, he lifted his chin up, and he had a steely glare as he looked at the people who were gathered around him to purchase him. The slave trader knew why, and he spoke up saying, what makes this young man different from all of the rest is that he's the son of a king, and he refuses to forget that. You and I, my brothers and sisters, are also sons and daughters of the King of kings and the Lord of lords, and we should never forget that no matter what you and I are dealing with in life. God in his grace has adopted us as his sons and his daughters. He's made us princesses princes in his eternal kingdom. And nothing, absolutely nothing, can take that away from you and me. That's because in Christ, we not only have identity, we have the security of knowing that God who is for us is always with us, and who will never forsake us. A lot of the children in this world, of this world, pardon me, fret and worry about being sick, losing their material possessions, forfeiting their jobs, even dying. The actor Woody Allen made this comment many years ago. He said, it's it's not that I'm afraid to die. I, I just don't want to be there when it happens. Well, that's true for a lot of people. They, they'll do any and everything they can to avoid dying, and it's not that you and I should be irresponsible or careless at this time, but we shouldn't be careworn either. God from all eternity has known about the coronavirus and every other aspect of your life. As we talked about last Sunday in worship, even the very hairs of our head are all numbered. God knows everything about every one of us. He has before the world was ever formed. And he knows what you and I need. What we need isn't necessarily to live a life of ease here on earth. What we need is his grace and everlasting life in heaven through faith in Christ. And that's what he's given us through our Savior, Jesus Christ. Because of that, you and I can say, I'm not afraid to die. You know, Job, 4,000 years ago, asked this question, if a man dies, will he live again? We know that the answer to that question is yes, we will live again forever in our heavenly Father's kingdom because of the perfect life, the substitutionary death, and the glorious resurrection of Jesus Christ for us. God has put every one of us on the road to paradise. And even though, as Jesus said earlier, in this life you will have trouble, he's also guaranteed us that he has overcome the world for each and every one of us. That's why his promise to us means so much when he says, my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me, and I will give to them eternal life, and they will never perish. You and I are going to live forever by God's grace through Jesus Christ, our Savior. We have an everlasting security. And sisters and brothers, we have a purpose too. That purpose, first of all, is to come to faith in Jesus Christ, our Savior. And God in his grace through the working of the Holy Spirit has brought us out of unbelief into the light of faith in Jesus Christ. And he's kept us in the faith over these years. And if we continue in his word, especially during this trying time, he will keep us in that faith and our faith will burn more brightly. But he hasn't taken us to heaven yet because he's got another purpose for every one of us. And that purpose is that while we are living here growing in our faith, we will continue to worship him through our lives and we'll continue to serve him.
by serving others, and in particular, by sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ with others at this time, more than any other, perhaps. People need to know about the hope and the peace in Christ alone that they can have, a peace that goes beyond human comprehension, a peace that far surpasses any threat that the coronavirus could bring to you and me. You and I have that peace, and with that peace, we have a purpose, a commitment to serve God with everything that we are and everything that we have. Again, there's a story that goes back 170 years during the days when slavery still was a part of the American fabric. A young woman in New Orleans uh, was put up on the slave trading block, and people bid for her because she was beautiful and because, well, you know, the bidding started at $500, and it was fast and furious. It went up and up and up. A bid of 1000 wasn't enough to win her. Finally, a northerner of all people bid $1,400 to purchase that young woman. After the auction was done and all of the paperwork taken care of, he went to the woman to claim her. And with tears in her eyes, she looked at him and said, Sir, I'll go wherever you want me to go. And then he handed her the paperwork that he had been given. She stared at it, and she began to cry even more. She could hardly believe her eyes because of what those papers said. She looked at him with trembling lips and said, Is this true? And he said, Yes, you have your freedom. But, she said, I, I thought that you bought me. And he said, I did. But I bought you so that you could be free. She said, you mean, I no longer am owned by anyone and I won't be a slave to anyone ever? I can do whatever I want. And he said, absolutely. And then she looked at him and said, then I want to serve you the rest of my life. The Lord Jesus Christ has bought us with his blood. He has given us uh, an antiviral medication, not from the coronavirus, but a greater, far more deadly virus that claims every person who's been born, and that is the virus of sin. Through his sinless blood, he has inoculated every one of us who believes in him. And not one of us ever has to fear dying indeed, we can rejoice. Rejoice because we have an identity as God's children and heaven's heirs. We have an eternal security that no one and nothing can take away from us. And you and I have a purpose, a purpose for living today and every day on this earth. The purpose so that in whether we eat or drink or whatever we do, we do it all to the glory of God as we serve him until that day comes when we live with him forever in heaven. And that's why, sisters and brothers, as the Apostle Paul said to the congregation in Philippi 2,000 years ago, he says to you, and he says to me today, rejoice in the Lord always. And I will say it again, rejoice. In Jesus' name, amen. And now let's bow our heads in prayer. Heavenly Father, bless us during these trying times. We pray for our country, for our world. We pray for our community and for everyone in our congregation and extended family as we deal with a great unknown, this worldwide pandemic known as the coronavirus 19. Calm our concerns with the assurance that you are capably in control of all things and that you are aware of everything that every one of us needs. We implore you, Lord, to keep us physically safe from this deadly virus and that you would especially keep safe those who are working in the medical health care field, as well as the public service field, and those who are providing essential services for the good functioning of our society. During these trying times, keep us from being selfish, angry, despondent, and whatever other emotions and behaviors would prove harmful to us and others and would dishonor you, O oh Lord. Bless our governmental leaders at every level as they struggle to maintain public health, good order, 
and a sound economy for us. Also bless the efforts of those people who are searching to find the medical means to control and to cure this virus quickly and miraculously, O oh Lord. Grant them the success that they seek and even more than they are seeking. And Lord, for every one of us during these trying times, allow us to use this vehicle of prayer to reach out to you asking that you would meet all of our needs and to use the power of your word, Heavenly Father, to grow us in our faith that we might share that faith in Jesus with others, our assurance of peace and everlasting life through faith in Jesus our Savior. Keep us all strong in this faith until that day comes when for us faith becomes reality and we live with you forever in heaven. We ask all of this in Jesus' name and we continue now with the prayer that Jesus has given us, our Father who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. And may the Lord look upon you with favor and grant you his peace. Amen.